Book of Esther. The Book of Esther, also known in Hebrew as the Scroll, Megillah, is a book in the third section, Ketuvim, writings, of the Jewish Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, and, in a version with some additions, in the Christian Old Testament. It is one of the five scrolls, Megillot, in the Hebrew Bible. It relates the story of a Hebrew woman in Persia, born as Hadassah but known as Esther who becomes queen of Persia and thwarts the genocide of her people. The story forms the core of the Jewish festival of Purim, during which it is read aloud twice, once in the evening and again the following morning. The books of Esther and Song of Songs are the only books in the Hebrew Bible that do not explicitly mention God. The biblical book of Esther is set in the Persian capital of Susa, Shushan, in the third year of the reign of the Persian king Ahasuerus. The name Ahasuerus is equivalent to Xerxes, both deriving from the Persian Xhiarsha and Ahasuerus is usually identified in modern sources as Xerxes I, who ruled between 486 and 465 BC, as it is to this monarch that the events described in Esther are thought to fit the most closely. Assuming that Ahasuerus is indeed Xerxes I, the events described in Esther began around the years 483 to 482 BC, and concluded in March 473 BC. Classical sources such as Josephus, the Jewish commentary Esther Rabbah and the Christian theologian Bar Hebraeus, as well as the Greek Septuagint translation of Esther, instead identify Ahasuerus as either Artaxerxes I, reigned 465 to 424 BC, or Artaxerxes II, reigned 404 to 358 BC. On his accession, however, Artaxerxes II lost Egypt to Pharaoh Amertius after which it was no longer part of the Persian Empire. In his Historia Scholastica Petrusca Mester identified Ahasuerus, Esther 1 1, as Artaxerxes III, 358 to 338 BC, who reconquered Egypt. The Book of Esther consists of an introduction, or exposition, in chapters 1 and 2, the main action, complication and resolution, in chapters 3 to 9 19, and a conclusion in 9 20 to 10 to 3. The plot is structured around banquets, mishte, a word that occurs 20 times in Esther and only 24 times in the rest of the Hebrew Bible. This is appropriate given that Esther describes the origin of a Jewish feast, the Feast of Purim, but Purim itself is not the subject and no individual feast in the book is commemorated by Purim. The book's theme, rather, is the reversal of destiny through a sudden and unexpected turn of events, the Jews seem destined to be destroyed, but instead are saved. In literary criticism such a reversal is termed peripety, and while on one level its use in Esther is simply a literary or aesthetic device, on another it is structural to the author's theme, suggesting that the power of God is at work behind human events. King Ahasuerus, ruler of the Persian Empire, holds a lavish 180-day banquet, initially for his court and dignitaries and afterwards a seven-day banquet for all inhabitants of the capital city, Shushan. Esther 1-1-9 on the seventh day of the latter banquet, Ahasuerus orders the queen, Vashti, to display her beauty before the guests by coming before them wearing her crown. 110-11, she refuses, infuriating Ahasuerus, who on the advice of his counselors removes her from her position as an example to other women who might be emboldened to disobey their husbands. 112-19, a decree follows that that every man should bear rule in his own house. 120-22. Ahasuerus then makes arrangements to choose a new queen from a selection of beautiful young women from throughout the empire. 2-1-4, among these women is a Jewish orphan named Esther, who was raised by her cousin or uncle, Mordecai. 2-5-7, she finds favor in the king's eyes, and is crowned his new queen, but does not reveal her Jewish heritage. 2-8-20, shortly afterwards, Mordecai discovers a plot by two courtiers, Bigthan and Teresh, to assassinate Ahasuerus. The conspirators are apprehended and hanged, and Mordecai's service to the king is recorded. 221-23 Ahasuerus appoints Haman as his viceroy. 3-1, Mordecai, who sits at the palace gates, falls into Haman's disfavor, as he refuses to bow down to him. 3-2-5, Haman discovers that Mordecai refused to bow on account of his Jewishness, and in revenge plots to kill not just Mordecai, but all the Jews in the empire. 3-6 he obtains Ahasuerus' permission to execute this plan, against payment of 10,000 talents of silver, and casts lots, Purim, to choose the date in which to do this the 13th of the month of Adar. 3-7-12, a royal decree is issued throughout the kingdom to slay all Jews on that date. 3-13-15. When Mordecai discovers the plan, 
he goes into mourning and implores Esther to intercede with the king. 4 to 1 to 5, but she is afraid to present herself to the king and summoned, an offense punishable by death. 4 to 6 to 12, instead, she directs Mordecai to have all Jews fast for three days for her, and vows to fast as well. 4 15 to 16, on the third day she goes to Ahasuerus, who stretches out his scepter to her to indicate that she is not to be punished. 5 to 1 to 2, she invites him to a feast in the company of Haman. 5 to 3 to 5, during the feast, she asks them to attend a further feast the next evening. 5 to 6 to 8, meanwhile, Haman is again offended by Mordecai and, at his wife's suggestion, has a gallows built to hang him. 5 to 9 to 14. That night, Ahasuerus cannot sleep, and orders the court records be read to him. 6 to 1, he is reminded that Mordecai interceded in the previous plot against Thay's life, and discovers that Mordecai never received any recognition. 6 to 2 to 3, just then, Haman appears to request the king's permission to hang Mordecai, but before he can make this request, Ahasuerus asks Haman what should be done for the man that the king wishes to honor. 6 to 4 to 6, assuming that the king is referring to Haman himself, Haman suggests that the man be dressed in the king's royal robes and led around on the king's royal horse, while a herald calls, see how the king honors a man he wishes to reward. 6 to 7 to 9, to his surprise and horror, the king instructs Haman to doso to Mordecai. 6 10 to 11. Immediately after, Ahasuerus and Haman attend Esther's second banquet. The king promises to grant her any request, and she reveals that she is Jewish and had Haman is planning to exterminate her people, including her. 7 to 1 to 6, overcome by rage, Ahasuerus leaves the room, meanwhile Haman stays behind and picks Esther for his life, falling upon her in desperation. 7 to 7, the king returns in at this very moment and thinks Haman is assaulting the queen, this makes him angrier and he orders Haman hanged on the very gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai. 7 to 8 to 10. Unable to annul a formal royal decree, the king instead adds to it permitting the Jews to join together and destroy any and all of those seeking to oppress them. 8 to 1 to 14, on 13 Adar, Haman's ten sons and five hundred other men are killed in Shushan. 9 to 1 to 12, upon hearing of this Esther requests it be repeated the next day, whereupon three hundred more men are killed. 9 13 to 15, over seventy-five thousand people are slaughtered by the Jews, who are careful to take no plunder. 9 16 to 17, Mordecai and Esther send letters throughout the provinces instituting an annual commemoration of the Jewish people's redemption, in a holiday called Purim, Lots. 920-28, Ahasuerus remains very powerful and continues his reign, with Mordecai assuming a prominent position in his court. 10-1-3. The Mija Esther, Book of Esther, became the last of the 24 books of the Tanakh to be canonized by the sages of the Great Assembly. According to the Talmud, it was a redaction by the Great Assembly of an original text by Mordecai. It is usually dated to the 4th century BC Shemar Yahu Tilmon, however, suggests that the traditional setting of the book in the days of Xerxes I cannot be wide off the mark. The Great Book of Esther, included in the Septuagint, is a retelling of the events of the Hebrew Book of Esther rather than a translation and records additional traditions which do not appear in original Hebrew version, in particular the identification of Ahasuerus with Artaxerxes and details of various letters. It is dated around the late 2nd to early 1st century BC. The Coptic and Ethiopic versions of Esther are translations of the Greek rather than the Hebrew Esther. A Latin version of Esther was produced by Jerome for the Vulgate. It translates the Hebrew Esther but interpolates translations of the Greek Esther where the latter provides additional material. Several Aramaic Targums of Esther were produced in the Middle Ages of which two survive, the Targum Rishon, 1st Targum, and Targum Shini, 2nd Targum, dated circa 500 to 1000 AD. These were not Targums, translations, in the true sense but like the Greek Esther are retellings of events and include additional legends relating to Purim. There is also a 16th century recension of the Targum Rishon, sometimes counted as Targum Shalishi, 3rd Targum. The Book of Esther falls under the category of Ketuvim, one of three parts of the Jewish canon. According to some sources, it is a historical novella, written to explain the origin of the Jewish holiday of Purim. As noted by biblical scholar Michael D. Coogan, the book contains specific details regarding certain subject matter, for example, Persian rule which are historically inaccurate. For example, Coogan discusses an apparent inaccuracy regarding the age of Esther's cousin, or, 
according to others, uncle, Mordecai. In Esther 2 5 6, either Mordecai or his great grandfather Kish is identified as having been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar II in 597 BC, Mordecai, son of Yer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jeconia, king of Judah. If this refers to Mordecai, he would have had to live over a century to have witnessed the events described in the book of Esther. However, the verse may be read as referring not to Mordecai's exile to Babylon, but to his great-grandfather Kish's exile. In her article The Book of Esther and Ancient Storytelling, biblical scholar Adele Berlin discusses the reasoning behind scholarly concern about the historicity of Esther. Much of this debate relates to the importance of distinguishing history and fiction within biblical texts, as Berlin argues, in order to gain a more accurate understanding of the history of the Israelite people. Berlin quotes a series of scholars who suggest that the author of Esther did not mean for the book to be considered as a historical writing, but intentionally wrote it to be a historical novella. The genre of novellas under which Esther falls was common during both Persian and Hellenistic periods to which scholars have dated the Book of Esther. There are certain elements of the Book of Esther that are historically accurate. The story told in the Book of Esther takes place during the rule of Ahasuerus, who amongst others has been identified as the 5th century Persian king Xerxes I, reigned 486-465 BC. The author also displays an accurate knowledge of Persian customs and palaces. However, according to Kugan, considerable historical inaccuracies remain throughout the text supporting the view that the Book of Esther is to be read as a historical novella which tells a story describing historical events but is not necessarily historical fact. Edwin M. Yamauchi has questioned the reliability of other historical sources, such as Herodotus, to which Esther has been compared. Yamauchi wrote, Herodotus, was, however, the victim of unreliable informants and was not infallible. The reason for questioning the historical accuracy of such ancient writers as Herodotus is that he is one of the primary sources of knowledge for this time period, and it has been frequently assumed that his account may be more accurate than Esther's account. Those arguing in favor of a historical reading of Esther most commonly identify Ahasuerus with Xerxes I, ruled 486-465 BC, although in the past it was often assumed that he was Artaxerxes II, ruled 405-359 BC. The Hebrew Ahasuerus, Ahasueros, is most likely derived from Persian Exiarsa, the origin of the Greek Xerxes. The Greek historian Herodotus wrote that Xerxes sought his harem after being defeated in the Greco-Persian Wars. He makes no reference to individual members of the harem except for a domineering queen consort named Amestris, whose father, Otanes, was one of Xerxes's generals. In contrast, the Greek historian Tejas refers to a similar father-in-law slash general figure named Onaphas. Amestris has often been identified with Vashti, but this identification is problematic, as Amestris remained a powerful figure well into the reign of her son, Artaxerxes I, whereas Vashti is portrayed as dismissed in the early part of Xerxes's reign. Alternative attempts have been made to identify her with Esther, although Esther is an orphan whose father was a Jew named Abihail. As for the identity of Mordecai, the similar names Marduka and Marjaku have been found as the name of officials in the Persian court in over 30 texts from the period of Xerxes I and his father Darius I, and may refer to up to four individuals, one of which might after all be Mordecai. The Old Greek Septuagint version of Esther translates the name Ahasuerus as Artaxerxes, a Greek name derived from the Persian Artaxatheta. Josephus II relates that this was the name by which he was known to the Greeks, and the Midrashic text. Esther Rabbah also makes the identification. Bar Hebraeus identified Ahasuerus explicitly as Artaxerxes II, however, the names are not necessarily equivalent. Hebrew has a form of the name Artaxerxes distinct from Ahasuerus, and a direct Greek rendering of Ahasuerus is used by both Josephus and the Septuagint for occurrences of the name outside the Book of Esther. Instead, the Hebrew name Ahasuerus accords with an inscription of the time that notes that Artaxerxes II was named also Asu understood as a shortening of Ahasuerus the Babylonian rendering of the Persian Exiarsa, Xerxes, through which the Hebrew Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus, is derived. Dejas related that Artaxerxes II was also called Arsikas which is understood as a similar shortening with the Persian suffix K that is applied to shortened names. Dianon related that Artaxerxes II was also called Dorsas which is also understood to be derived from Exiarsa. Another view attempts to identify him instead with Artaxerxes I, ruled 465-424 BC, 
whose Babylonian concubine, Cosmarty Dean, was the mother of his son Darius II, ruled 424-405 BC. Jewish tradition relates that Esther was the mother of a king Darius and so some try to identify Ahasuerus with Artaxerxes I and Esther with Cosmarty Dean. Based on the view that the Ahasuerus of the Book of Tobit is identical with that of the Book of Esther, some have also identified him as Nebuchadnezzar's ally Syaxares, ruled 625-585 BC. In certain manuscripts of Tobit, the former is called Achiachar, which, like the Greek Syaxares, is thought to be derived from Persian Hexathetera. Depending on the interpretation of Esther 2 5-6, Mordecai or his great-grandfather Kish was carried away from Jerusalem with Jeconiabi Nebuchadnezzar, in 597 BC. The view that it was Mordecai would be consistent with the identification of Ahasuerus with Syaxares. Identifications with other Persian monarchs have also been suggested. Jacob Hoshander has argued that evidence of the historicity of Haman and his father Hamadatha is seen in Omanus and Anadatus mentioned by Strabo as being honored with Anahita in the city of Zela. Hoshander argues that these were not deities as Strabo supposed but garbled forms of Haman and Hamadatha who were being worshipped as martyrs. The names are indeed unattested in Persian texts as gods, however the Talmud, Sanhedrin 61b, and Rashi both record a practice of deifying Haman and Josephus speaks of him being worshipped. Attempts have been made to connect both Amanus and Haman with the Zoroastrian term Bohemana, however this denotes the principle of good thoughts and is not the name of a deity. In his Historia Scholastica Petrusca Mester identified Ahasuerus, Esther 1-1, as Artaxerxes III who reconquered Egypt. Christine Hayes contrasts the Book of Esther with apocalyptic writings, the Book of Daniel in particular. Both Esther and Daniel depict an existential threat to the Jewish people, but while Daniel commends the Jews to wait faithfully for God to resolve the crisis, in Esther the crisis is resolved entirely through human action and national solidarity. God, in fact, is not mentioned. Esther is portrayed as assimilated to Persian culture, and Jewish identity in the book is an ethnic category rather than a religious one. This contrasts with traditional Jewish commentaries, such as the commentary of the Vilna Gaon, which states but in every verse it discusses the great miracle. However, this miracle was in a hidden form, occurring through apparently natural processes, not like the Exodus from Egypt, which openly revealed the might of God. This follows the approach of the Talmud, which states that, the book of, Esther is referenced in the Torah in the verse and I shall surely hide, in Hebrew, Hester Esther, related to Esther, my face from them on that day. An additional six chapters appear interspersed in Esther in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible. This was noted by Jerome in compiling the Latin Vulgate. Additionally, the Greek text contains many small changes in the meaning of the main text. Jerome recognized the former as additions not present in the Hebrew text and placed them at the end of his Latin translation. This placement and numbering system is used in Catholic Bible translations based primarily in the Vulgate, such as the Douay Reims Bible and the Knox Bible. In contrast, the 1979 revision of the Vulgate, the Nova Vulgata, incorporates the additions to Esther directly into the narrative itself, as do most modern Catholic English translations based on the original Hebrew and Greek, for example, Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition, New American Bible, New Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. The numbering system for the editions differs with each translation. The Nova Vulgata accounts for the additional verses by numbering them as extensions off the verses immediately following or preceding them, for example, Esther 11 2-12 in the Old Vulgate becomes Esther 1-1 A1K in the Nova Vulgata, while the Nab and its successor, the neighbor, Assign letters of the alphabet as chapter headings for the editions, for example, Esther 11 2-12-6 to in the Vulgate becomes Esther A 1-17. The Rsfs and the Nsfs place the additional material into the narrative, but retain the chapter on verse numbering of the Old Vulgate. These editions include by the time Esther was written, the foreign power visible on the horizon as a future threat to Judah was the Macedonians of Alexander the Great who defeated the Persian Empire about 150 years after the time of the story of Esther, the Septuagint version noticeably calls Haman a Bugan, Beta Omicron Upsilon Gamma Alpha Omicron Nu where the Hebrew text describes him as an Agagai. The canonicity of these Greek editions has been a subject of scholarly disagreement practically since their first appearance in the Septuagint Martin Luther, being perhaps the most vocal Reformation-era critic of the work 
considered even the original Hebrew version to be a very doubtful value. Luther's complaints against the book carried past the point of scholarly critique and may reflect Luther's anti Semitism, which is disputed, such as in the biography of Luther by Derek Wilson, which points out that Luther's anger at the Jews was not at their race but at their theology. The Council of Trent, the summation of the Roman Catholic Counter Reformation, reconfirmed the entire book, both Hebrew text and Greek editions, as canonical. The Book of Esther is used twice in commonly used sections of the Catholic lectionary. In both cases, the text used is not only taken from a Greek edition, the readings also are the prayer of Mordecai, and nothing of Esther's own words is ever used. The Eastern Orthodox Church uses the Septuagint version of Esther, as it does for all of the Old Testament. In contrast, the editions are included in the Biblical Apocrypha, usually printed in a separate section, if at all. In Protestant Bibles. The editions, called the rest of the Book of Esther, are specifically listed in the 39 Articles, Article V, of the Church of England as non canonical. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.